there's the political aspect, but there's another aspect of Hollywood, the moral one. Why does it have such a high divorce rate? Why even many years ago, before the divorce rate was what it is now, did Hollywood have such a high divorce rate? It was not uncommon for film stars to have been married and remarried four and five times, even as far back as the 1920s and 30s. Why is it like that? Why is it so immoral? Why? Stage acting, there was obviously no film, but stage acting existed in the first century time of Paul. These were the thespians. You had Greek theater. You had a form of theater that was often tragicomical. There are actually some theater companies who can perform these ancient Greek tragedies like Agamemnon and things like this. They're still performed at Lincoln Center and places like that from time to time. Once again, going back to the first century, we had thespianism, we had public entertainment in music and in and theater, usually tragic comedy. Perhaps the quintessential pop artist of the 1970s and 80s was David Bowie. Highly unusual in that he was actually talented, which is not a common commodity among people involved in the world of rock. But David Bowie played the Elephant Man uh, successfully on Broadway to, to much critical acclaim. He was in films such as Absolute Beginners, and of course his, his music was quite innovative by the standards of rock and pop particularly. David Bowie had a lot of sociological insight, and he understood the evolution of worldviews going back to the 19th century and the relationship between demographics, worldviews, and how that would affect the music industry and popular culture. Sort of like a, a, something broadly parallel to the way Andy Warhol saw things. Not really the same, but both seeing social trends in light of social evolution and how that had an impact on, on the arts and on popular art particularly. And in his, his interview, a famous interview he did with the American interviewer Charlie Rose, David Bowie made the statement, artists by definition, artists by nature, are dysfunctional people. Knowing your background, you have always, always resisted any notion that this creativity that you have comes from any sort of dysfunctional or you know, madness I, out of it's, family. I think I've often wondered if, if actually the, being an artist of, of in any way, any nature, is a, a, a kind of a sign of a certain kind of dysfunction, a social dysfunctionalism anyway. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary thing to want to do, to express yourself in such, in such rarefied terms. Uh, uh, I, think there's a, a, I think it's a loony kind of thing to want to do. I think the, the saner and rational approach to life is to survive steadfastly and create a protective home and, 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 and create a warm, loving environment for one's family and, and get food for them. That's about it. That's actually all. Anything else is extra. All culture is extra. Culture is, uh, you know, that's, uh, I guess it's a freebie. It's something that we, we don't, we only need to eat. We don't need uh, particular color plates or particular height chairs or anything. I mean, anything will do, but we insist on making 1,000 different kinds of chairs and 15 different kinds of plates. It's, it's unnecessary, and it's a sign of the irrational part of man, I think. We should just be content with picking nuts. That's quite a statement to make by somebody who should know what he was talking about. Artists are dysfunctional. Well, unless someone's creative talents and innovative talents are committed to Christ, I agree, the arts do tend to make people dysfunctional. Again, just look at their personal lives. Everything from divorce to substance abuse, inability to really know who they themselves are because they always become a caricature of themselves. Artists are by nature dysfunctional, according to David Bowie, and others would agree with him, including others in the arts. But the scriptures do speak of things such as powers of the air, broadcasting, things of that nature. Let's understand the following. The nature of acting is pretending to be someone else. The nature of acting is pretending to be someone else. This creates an automatic problem for the human psyche. 
You can pretend to be someone else, but you can't become someone else. You are who you are. There are different methods of acting. Stanislavski is one, and there's one that goes beyond that, where you become the character. You imagine yourself to actually be that person to convincingly portray them on film. Or you actually become that person 24-7 while you're preparing to do the film, as Ben Kingsley, an actor I met in London once briefly, did for Gandhi, uh, when he played Gandhi. Um, again, you pretend to be someone else, but you hyper-focus within yourself to imagine yourself or pretend or live and speak as if you are that person while you are portraying them. The idea of becoming someone other than who you are. This creates an identity issue for people, an identity issue. I played Lincoln, I played Napoleon, I played Cinderella, but who am I? These people have high degrees of mental illness. All of them, virtually all of them, nearly all of them have psychiatrists, they're on tranquilizers, high rates of substance abuse, and an inability to live their own lives because they don't know if they're themselves or their characters. It has been said, I'm not who I think I am, I'm not who you think I am. But in Hollywood, it becomes, I am who I think that you think I am. They play out their persona of their characters. They become caricatures of their make-believe selves. This was one of the things that contributed to the alcoholism, alcohol abuse most certainly, and probably to his, his death of, of the actor who played Tony Soprano, of uh, James, uh, what was his name? Oh, sorry. Gandolfini. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Of, of James Gandolfini. He was a very convincing, very convincing gangster. I come from New York and New Jersey. I come from that area. I knew people like that. Uh, my father had been a policeman and he knew gangsters. He, he was quite convincing in, in the way he, he portrayed those people, but he virtually became them. Doing this plays games with someone's mind. So you have Robert De Niro in a film with Diane Keaton some years ago, he played a physician. He played a physician in a film with Diana Keaton. So all of a sudden now, he becomes a medical expert speaking about autism and the relationship of autism, allegedly, to inoculations in pediatric cases in children. Wait a minute, he's not a physician. He's an actor who played the role of a physician. Ah, they become unable to distinguish between the role they play and who they really are. In fact, they become the role instead of themselves. Very few people can handle that kind of fame and celebrity and maintain any semblance of normalcy in their personal lives, even sanity in some cases. They just can't handle it. In the world of rock music, pop music, particularly rock music, it's even more like that. But this is a problem that went back to composers who in their personal lives, even in, in classical music, were rather wild, self-destructive characters or, or, or people who hurt other people around them or who just couldn't function. We're speaking now of, of, of Mozart. We're speaking of Tchaikovsky. These people had serious issues. Something in the arts affects people in such a way as you become a caricature of yourself. But in acting, the caricature of yourself is not who you really are. Think of Michael Jackson. He did not know if he was an adult or a child. He didn't know. He didn't know what his religious beliefs were. His family had been Jehovah's Witnesses, but he went into every kind of new age philosophy imaginable. He wound up drug dependent, substance abusively, drug dependent. He had no identity other than this caricature of himself. He would sing, it doesn't matter if you're black or white, because he didn't know if he was black or white. He was like Peter Pan. He didn't know if he was an adult or a child. He didn't know race, sexuality, age. The things that define a person, he didn't know. He 
He was only a baby and a superstar. He was never a child. Most people cannot handle this. It will drive them self-destructively crazy. So you're dealing with people who have tremendous personal issues, tremendous personal issues among people in the arts. And success fuels it. Failure can drive them suicidal. Success can drive them self-destructive. You're not dealing with the most stable of people or personalities, broadly speaking. Now, that may be a generalization, and there are individual exceptions. But you see this repeatedly. In my youth, John Wayne was a Republican conservative, and he spoke out on issues concerning those who were protesting the Vietnam War. Those who were protesting the Vietnam War, however, said, <clears throat> wait a minute, John Wayne. You played Marines and you played Green Berets on the silver screen, but you punked out of World War II. <laughs> They've always got this conflict. Who's the real John Wayne, the Duke? Is that really him or is it just the person he plays on the silver screen? Now, this Hollywood and politics has worked both ways. Let's not forget, Shirley Temple Black was a Republican. Governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger, when the economy of California is in trouble, quit, call the toilet. It's just absurd. Didn't last very long as governor, and he wasn't very successful. But because he was the Terminator, he thought he could deal with the issues of California's complicated and failing fiscal madness caused by Greg Davis on the left. Let's go further. You had, and he was a Republican, Ronald Reagan, president, was a actor, a grade B actor who co-starred to a monkey. Literally. That's what he was. He was not a very successful actor. He was not a, a, a major figure. He's been president of the Screen Actors Guild, but he was accused by many of his members of collaborating with Roy Cohen, with Joe McCarthy, with J. Edgar Hoover against his own members during the McCarthy era, whose interest he should have been representing. He, that accusation was made against him. The whole thing is a big mess. It goes beyond Democrat and Republican. It goes to people thinking that they are somebody other than they really are because they get paid for being someone other than they really are. They confuse their success at the box office with success in life generally. They confuse their ability to play other people in other professions as being somehow knowledgeable of those professions themselves. Now, in the modern culture of celebrity and in the culture of media predicted by Andy Warhol, the pop artist, who was really a sociologist who used pop art instead of a typewriter or instead of a word processor to say the way society was being affected and the way it would go because of things like internet and other things he saw coming and the impact such things would have. In this culture of media, we have a culture of celebrity that results from it. Therefore, people begin looking to pop icons and Hollywood film stars to tell them what to do and what to believe. This began in the 60s when the Republicans wanted a tough guy, so they got John Wayne, a guy who the left said punked out of World War II. That's somebody we can trust because of the character they played in a movie. Get the Terminator to save the economy of California against Arnold Schwarzenegger. I saw one of the, I don't want to say who it was, but major muscle men of Hollywood, a A-listed film star, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> And he was about five and a half foot tall <laughs> in real life. He was drunk out of his mind. And I saw him in the lobby of a hotel in, in Beverly Hills with my daughter. You wouldn't believe it. It was just a joke. Yet people will emulate this person. Um, and he was a Republican, by the way, one of the few Hollywood Republicans. But there are people in Hollywood who are politically more conservative. Uh, the, the late producer, Jerry Weintraub, was a Jewish conservative. 
Uh, Jerry Bruckheimer, the major Hollywood producer, is a, is a Jewish Republican quasi-conservative. They're not all left center. Hollywood is about money, not about politics. Now let's understand something. When you see these film stars and pop stars, particularly film stars, going into political causes, 85% of the time, it is the death cry of someone whose career is in decline. They are past it. It is the Bianca Jagger syndrome. She hasn't been married to Mick Jagger since the 1970s. That was her claim to fame, but she still goes around calling herself Jagger. And she gets into these left-wing causes and goes on the media making angry speeches and things like this. She's using the name of a former husband and jumping on these bandwagons all the time for these left-wing causes because that's the only way she can remain relevant in socialite circles. It is the signature of a has-been. You look at these people who were, were making the, the, this advertisement, I suppose it was, trying to persuade delegates for the Electoral College not to vote for Donald Trump, even though they were elected to vote for him. Republican members of the Electoral College, this message is for you. As you know, our founding fathers built the Electoral College to safeguard the American people from the dangers of a demagogue and to ensure that the presidency only goes to someone who is to an eminent degree endowed with the requisite qualifications. An eminent degree. Someone who is highly qualified for the job. The Electoral College was created specifically to prevent an unfit candidate from becoming president. There are 538 members of the Electoral College. You and just 36 other conscientious Republican electors can make a difference by voting your conscience on December 19th and thereby shaping the future of our nation. I'm not asking you to vote for Hillary Clinton. I'm not asking you to vote for Hillary Clinton. I'm not asking you to vote for Hillary Clinton. As you know, the Constitution gives electors the right to vote for any eligible person. Any eligible person, no matter which party they belong to. But it should certainly be someone you consider especially competent. Especially competent to serve as President of the United States of America. By voting your conscience, you and other brave Republican electors can give the House of Representatives the option to select a qualified candidate for the presidency. I stand with you. I stand with you. I stand with you. I stand with you in support and solidarity with conservatives, independents, and liberals. And all citizens of the United States. The American people trust that your voice speaks for us all. And that you, you will make yourself heard through the constitutional responsibility granted to you by Alexander Hamilton himself. What is evident is that Donald Trump lacks more than the qualifications to be president. He lacks the necessary stability and clearly the respect for the constitution of our great nation. You have the position, the authority, and the opportunity to go down in the books as an American hero who changed the course of history. And you have my respect. You have my respect. You have my respect. For your patriotism and service to the American people. So that, that, that sweet woman from, from MASH, these are people whose careers are over. They've had it. They're bygones. Hollywood is about money. If you're not raking it in, they'll rake you out. They don't care. So the way that the has-beens try to remain somehow relevant is to jump onto some political bandwagon, usually of the organized left. Now, there are exceptions. There are exceptions, certainly. People like Barbara Streisand, whose son is homosexual, and others they grossly disappoint me, so does Tom Hanks. But you know, just think of Tom Hanks making himself a spokesman on aerospace or aeronautics because he played an astronaut in a movie. Uh, <laughs> most of them, however, are has-beens trying to stay relevant. When you see a film star going into this political activism, particularly left-wing, but not only left-wing, but usually left-wing, it is a death cry. It is them saying, I'm a vestige from an age gone by. I'm a has-been. I'm not happening anymore. 
You know, two failures in a row in Hollywood, and you're, you're a failure. Unless you're an A-list star, you're a failure. You're not coming back. Um, and even A-list stars, once they begin to go down, they don't get the film offers anymore. Meryl Streep being a case in point. She's not what she was as a draw. Talented actress, but they think because they're talented at playing other people, that makes them experts in other fields of the kind of people they play. She's not an expert in anything other than pretending to be somebody else. That's all she is. That's her expertise. She's a thespian. The basic problem in Hollywood goes back to the identity issue. When you professionally, you earn your livelihood by pretending to be someone else, where you must become someone else in your mind to do your job. Frank Sinatra said this when he was interviewed about the film From Here to Eternity. He said in his head, he'd become the character. Character acting. In your mind, you become that person. Those kind of identity issues frequently lead to substance abuse, frequently lead to mental illness, and almost inevitably lead to a series of failed marriages and an inability to pursue a steady, meaningful relationship and family. It's just the way it is. In Christ, in Christ, you actually can become another person. The old man, the old woman, dies with Christ on the cross. The old creation passes away. You actually do get a new identity in Jesus. Jesus can give you a new identity. Hollywood cannot. I have told the true story many times. I was with my daughter, and I was showing her in Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, Hollywood, where famous film stars were buried. I wanted to show her where the Little Rascals, the Al Gang, were buried. And so I went to the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. And I saw a statue of a guy playing guitar, and it was a guy who, i just curious, who is it? And I see it was somebody I knew and had been at parties with and taken drugs with and things like that. He was a guitar player from the Ramones. All four of the Ramones are now buried in that cemetery. Their career is over. It's gone. A few days later, I was still in Hollywood, Beverly Hills, Los Angeles area with my daughter, and Charles Bronson, the actor, died. And people went down to Hollywood Boulevard and were putting roses on the star with his name on it on the Walk of Fame. That's how they immortalized themselves. They tried to immortalize themselves on their films. They live forever. Boris Karloff is still alive. Bela Lugosi is still alive. Greta Garbo is still alive. This was creatively, if not brilliantly, encapsulated by the British rock band, The Kinks, in a song called Celluloid Heroes. Absolutely brilliant song. Most rock music is rubbish, but lyrically that song is incredibly insightful about the realities of Hollywood and thespianism. Celluloid Heroes <coughs> never really cry. It's only on a stage, only on a film. Celluloid Heroes never really die. Celluloid heroes never feel any pain. They live in this fantasy world where they have this other identity, where the human experiences of pain, grief, death, do not affect them because it does not affect their character. <laughs> but what about them? Absolutely brilliant song. I kind of know Ray Davies' brother, Dave, and I met Ray Davies once, don't know them well, but certainly talented. That song is incredible lyrically. Celluloid heroes, that's what they want to be. They think they can live forever through their films because you can always show a rerun of a film. You can put it up on Netflix, and then they have eternal life. <laughs> no, their character will have eternal life. They won't. The make-believe person who they play will have eternal life. They won't. They just die. They usually die in Cedars of Sinai Hospital, and they wind up in Hollywood Forever or Westwood Memorial Park 
or, or Fan, Fan Lawn Cemetery, or one of those places around LA where movie stars get interred, have their corpses buried. And that's what happens to them. Uh, they ain't like anyone else. Only their characters live on. They don't. But in Christ, we can live on. In Jesus, we have eternal life. It's not just a celluloid image of somebody else. It's the real us. Those who believe in him have life eternal. Hollywood is man's efforts to deliver things that man can never deliver. A new identity, an eternal life. When you invest in it, hope in it, and trust in it, when your career becomes your religion, <laughs> the result is going to be divorce, mental breakdown. <laughs> Surprisingly, with a high degree of frequency, bankruptcy, and a lot of hypocrisy. Uh, you just think of these people going on about global warming and they've got these SUV Cadillacs that are customized, gas guzzlers, private jets, carbon footprint. <laughs> They're the consumers who personify the very things that they claim to be against. The utter hypocrisy. Utter hypocrisy. Hollywood cannot deliver righteousness. Only hypocrisy, a pretense. Hollywood cannot deliver a new identity only a pretense, and Hollywood cannot deliver eternal life, only a pretense. Jesus can deliver those things. Now, having said that, I believe there are a few, a few true Christians in Hollywood who are salt and light in that industry and who make use of the mechanisms of Hollywood for God's purposes. A few, but only a few. Mostly, it's just more hypocrisy. I think of Mel Gibson, a stupid, stupid, historically inaccurate movie on the passion of Christ. Stupid movie. A film adaptation of a book by a Catholic mystic. It showed this who believed in the stigmata. And it showed the nails being driven through the metacarpal. No, the nails were not put through the metacarpal. We know from archaeology and from autopsies done on human cadavers that the nails would have gone through the radius, not the metacarpal. The whole book was off the wall and it was based on Catholic mysticism. Mel Gibson was interviewed by Diane Sawyer on ABC on Ash Wednesday, the day before the film premiered, and he refused to discuss the Holocaust denial of his father, as was alleged. I think people wondered if your father's views were your views on this. Their whole agenda here, my detractors, is to drive a wedge between me and my father. And it's not going to happen. I love him. He's my father. And you, you will not speak publicly about him. I'm tight that. with him. He's my father. Got to leave it alone, Diane. I'll leave it alone. I said, don't go there. Yet we had one naive, gullible, evangelical leader after another lining up to kneel down and kiss his feet. Now, I have a somewhat higher view of people like David White and of uh, Jerry Weintraub's son, Michael Weintraub. There are others in that industry I have a somewhat a, a, a higher view of. I do believe there are people in that industry who do love Jesus and who are not taken in or seduced by him. But again, they are very few and very far between. It is a dangerous world to be in as a believer, much the same as pop music, a dangerous world to be in. The Lord is able to keep you in it if he wants you in it. But if I had anything to do with it, I'd make sure he wanted me in it. This is Hollywood. Again, it will not give the righteousness it poses. The black hats and the white hats, the good guys and the bad guys, 
Hollywood cannot impute righteousness. Only Jesus can. Hollywood cannot impute a new identity. Only Jesus can. And Hollywood cannot impute eternal life. Only Jesus can. Hollywood should better <clears throat> be renamed Hollywood because its devotees are overwhelmingly heading there. May the Lord have mercy. Thank you for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print for the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. First being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.